and thank you Phoenix Christian School. What a great class.
He was a member of the 3rd Infantry Division. He was also a member of the 15th Infantry Regiment. He was in the 1st Battalion. I was in the 2nd Battalion in the Korean War. But it seemed as though that we got particularly enthusiastic challenges asked of us to do because we seemed to be able to get the task accomplished. And he certainly was a great role model, and we tried to emulate him, but all of us fell short of Audie. Audie was the most decorated American soldier in World War II. He back, became a film star in Hollywood. Around 1948, he went down to the VA. He said, you know, I'm not sleeping too good at night. I'm having, uh, we didn't have the term flashbacks yet. He said, I'm seeing pictures in my mind of things that happened overseas in Europe. And he said, that's all right, already. Don't worry about it. It'll all go away. Oh, uh -huh. it didn't go away. Or he died a very young death at 43 years old in a plane crash in Pennsylvania. So a lot has happened since then in which there have been many advantage, advances in military medicine. But at the time of these events that I'm going to share with you today, there was more unknown than known. And it has been stated already on April 24th. 1953. 1953? <laughs> Am I the only one here? <laughs> well, I'm with good company because my wife was also born in. She's with all I am. <laughs> I almost made a bad mistake. <laughs> you never tell your wife's age, you never tell when she was born. She was alive in 1953, although I didn't know her at that time. My company was F Company, the 15th Infantry Regiment, and we had the responsibility of defending Tom, Dick, and Harry. It made the names easy so us Americans could remember where we were. And so if we had trouble, we know where to get back. Now, I was on outpost Harry, which was the highest of the three positions, and it received the most attention from the enemy. And on the night of April 24th, we were attacked by a reinforced battalion of over 1,000 Chinese. And the Chinese were great fighters. They drove, they drove right into their own artillery. And right up the hill, they blew bugles, they blew horns, they whistles. And they came frequently because they wanted that strategic location. We're only 50 miles north of Seoul, the capital of South Korea. There had been stagnant lines for almost two years. Truce talks had been going on for all that time. And the sticking point in the truce talks, believe it or not, was what to do with the POWs, whether to require them to force repatriation or to allow voluntary repatriation. Because in World War II, all the Russian prisoners of the Germans were returned to Russia and were massacred by their countrymen for being traitors enough to become prisoners of war. And so the United States government did not want that to happen again and did not want to be a party to that. So they were, we were, our side was insisting upon voluntary repatriation. Our positions were always one. There were just simply too many against us. As a matter of fact, our forward artillery advisor called in the American artillery on top of us to stop them. It's called time on target, in which you pour your own artillery in on top of you to stop the enemy. The unfortunate thing about that is that artillery doesn't know the difference between friend and foe. And so it's a desperation measure, and it would seem necessary because orders had come down from 8th Army headquarters in Japan that this particular piece of real estate had to be held at all costs. All costs, as you can imagine, is the most difficult order a soldier can receive. 
because it means that you must prevail in your mission or die trying. You can't leave, you can't redeploy, you can't advance in the rear, you can't advance anywhere except forward. If you can, you must maintain your position or die trying. We're very heavy casualties, as Mike pointed out, and for 53 years, I thought I was the lone American survivor. I burned up the barrel on my Browning automatic rifle. You're supposed to shoot two or three cartridges in burst. Burp, burp. There are 20 rounds in a magazine on a Browning automatic rifle, and I pulled the trigger and I let all 20 go out. I let all 20 go out long enough until the barrel burned up. And I had been wounded. And so I was a pretty easy catch for them, and I'm lying on the ground. And I'm looking up the barrel of a Russian-made submachine gun that we nicknamed the Burp Gun. And the reason we nicknamed it the Burp Gun because that's what it sounded like, 900 rounds a minute it would fire. And it sounded like this, burp, 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 burp. But it was very inaccurate. It was great for close quarters because we were in trenches seven feet deep, three to four feet wide. We've been there a while. I'm lying on the ground looking up the barrel of that submachine gun, and in my mind's voice, I said to myself, David, you are going to die. Fortunately, I have been raised in a family of Christian faith, and I knew what to do. I prayed the prayer of a sinner. I said in my mind's voice to God, Oh God, have mercy on my soul. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm here to tell you, that a peace came over me that I had never felt before, nor have I felt exactly the same since. I accepted my fate, and I was prepared to die. And my next thought was, I wonder how my parents are going to take this. Then, my next thought was, if I could get that submachine gun out of that soldier's hand, I would kill all three of them. Now, it'll take the Lord to figure this sequence of statements out. And then I got scared again. Chinese took me off the hill. They roughed me up on the way back to a cave. I don't know how far we went. I don't know how long it took. I know that by the time we got there, that I was being half dragged and half crawled, and they put me in a cave. Or there was a wounded Chinese soldier in there. And he died during the middle of the night. And even under those circumstances, I was so tired, I fell asleep. Upon being awakened the next morning, I was motioned to go outside and I limped as best as I could because six of my wounds were in my legs. And I tried a, a motion for me to start walking up a path, which I could not. I could not walk. I tried several times, but my legs simply would not hold. Pain was too great. So there was motion for me to sit down on a rock, which I did. And they went around the corner, and I thought, well, I had heard stories from the 1950s or early on when the lines were mobile about some of the atrocities the American prisoners of war had suffered at the hands of their enemies with their hands tied behind their back and shot in different places. And some had died of their wounds, and some had died from frostbite because of the cold weather conditions. 
and I thought this would happen to me, and so I made my peace with God again. But surprise to me, four little soldiers came around a corner with a regular canvas stretcher. And they put me on that stretcher. And they carried me all day long. Now I was a little taller then than I am now. I'm a little, my wife told me, stand up straight, stand up straight. <laughs> I'm trying to stand up straight. I was six feet tall and I was in great shape, 175 pounds. And they were looked to be about four feet five, maybe they were a little taller than that, but not much. And they were strong as all get out. They carried me all day long. And that evening, we stopped, as Mike had pointed out, we stopped at a hut. There was one Chinese officer sitting in that hut by himself with a pistol on his back. I found I became known to me as an officer. He became known to me as an officer later when I realized that all Chinese officers had long hair. All Chinese enlisted men had shaved heads. This gentleman had long hair and he spoke English grammatically better than I did. My first interrogation was about to begin and there I was. Received no medical attention for my nine wounds. Had not eaten in over 24 hours. Scared to death was not allowed to urinate. I had been given hot water during the daytime, but no food. I was becoming very uncomfortable and my abdomen was becoming distended. Things didn't look too good. And I'm thinking I'm probably never gonna get out of here. And the first question was, are there any Japanese troops in your lines? Second question was, why do Americans fight so fiercely when you're cornered? And the third question was, are you a Christian? Wow, knocked my socks off. Now, I'm not, I don't know about officers, but I know if we were enlisted men, and I was just a private, I was one step above a raw recruit going through basic training. The Uniform Code of Military Justice required our answers to every question, name, rank, and serial number. Period. Now maybe if you were an officer, you might have had a little wiggle room. Most of them were smarter than we were. Most of them were older than we were. And most of them were, had a better idea about things. But here I was, a private, 17-year-old private, shot up and they carried me all day long so I could talk to this guy so he could ask me if I'm a Christian what is going on here I thought the communists were atheists and they are well I didn't answer right I thought and I'll tell you why Having come from a family of faith, I know what the scripture said. You know what the scripture said. They say this. This is the first hand. If you confess me before man, I will confess you before the Father. That's only half of it. But if you deny me before man, I will deny you before the Father. That is a big statement. And as a believer, I took that to heart. However, I must say, I didn't beat my chest and stick it out and say, you bet. I thought long and hard. I said, you know, this could be my voice. <laughs> but then I thought, someone's already given her way for me. And his name is Jesus. And so very pathetically actually, very quietly, 
very frightened thing? Very, I said, yes. I am a Christian. I can't remember the rest of the night at all. But the next day, the same four guys that carried me the day before came again with a stretcher. And they picked me up at dawn and they carried me all day long until dusk. And they did that for seven or eight consecutive days and protected me from the North Korean civilians who tried to get at me with farm implements to do me harm. Until we reached what I refer to as a prisoner collection. sufficiently far enough to put my legs straight. There was an earthen floor and, a, and the dungeon was only about three feet high. When it rained, the water ran in and I laid in it until it evaporated or soaked into the ground. Body lights were abundant I used a lot of my time cracking the spines of life infested in the seams of my clothing. I was unable to eat the food offered and consequently was losing a lot of weight quickly. My right leg hurt so badly that I asked the Chinese to cut it off. They did not. The situation looked pretty bleak and I was getting weaker. I began to wonder if I was ever going to get home. It was at this low point that I determined to do the best that I could. And as difficult it was with God's help, the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer specifically, I began to eat whatever was put before me regardless of how it looked regardless of how it smelled and regardless of how it tasted. Every day brought new challenges, including being accused of committing grave crimes against the People's Republic of China on two occasions, which were supposed to result in triumph, but never did. Being bombed and strafed in our prison camp by American planes resulted in only Chinese casualties. And in my opinion, the greatest act of courage by a soldier I ever knew of, and one which I do not believe has been or will be militarily acclaimed but I briefly will tell you what it is in three or four sentences. Our Camp Barber was a prisoner of war who was a graduate of Oxford University in England. He was a very religious man. And that morning, about eight o'clock, he was sharing devotions with an Australian soldier who had been shot in the lake and was immobile. Oxford grad was reading the scriptures to him out of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. The American planes bombed and strafed. The Oxford grad could have left. The Australian soldier and sought safer environment. But he did not. He sat there and continued to read 
the Holy Bible to this soldier who could not leave. And when the attack was over, it was noticed that there were bullet holes in the walls of the room they were occupying only three or four feet from where they sat. Eventually, I was repatriated on August 24, 1953, and returned to the United States. Now fast forward 53 years to 2006. My wife and I were attending the first Outpost Harry Survivors Association reunion, their 15th, in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was going to speak at the opening banquet. It would be the first time for me to speak publicly about my POW experiences in 53 years. And the second time was to A.J. Davis of Cactus Shadow High School, Cape Creek, my interview in 2011. Before entering the banquet room, we were introduced to a gentleman my age by the name of Warren Cecil. And as it turned out, to his beautiful six foot tall young Chinese wife. He came up to me and he said, Mel's, he poked me in the chest with his finger. I have come all the way from China to hear you talk. I said, you had? He said, yes. I told him that he was going to be disappointed. He said, why? I said, I'm not that good. <laughs> he also said that he was personally acquainted with a former chief interrogating officer of the Chinese 74th Infantry Division. I asked him if that was a unit we fixed on Outpost Harry, and he said that it was. I then asked Warren if the former chief interrogating officer was a Christian. Warren was somewhat taken aback by my question and curious about my inquiry. Warren said that he didn't know, so I related to him what I've just told you. I asked Warren that when he returned to China and saw this gentleman to give him a message for me. First, give him my regards. And secondly, thank him for not killing me. My wife and I saw Warren and his wife again in 2009 at a military reunion in Springfield, Missouri. And he couldn't wait to tell me that the former chief interrogating officer was indeed a Christian. We saw Warren again in 2010 at a reunion of the Outpost Harry Survivors Association in San Diego, California. And he couldn't wait to tell us that this former Chinese officer was not only a Christian, but had been educated in a Christian missionary school in China. I pose this question to you. I know there's a lot of smart people in this room. There don't have any dummies in the Phoenix Christian School. <laughs> That's right. Everybody here is smart. I know that. So I pose this question to you. I'm not going to ask you about standard deviations from the mean. I'm not going to do that. But it's close to it. What do you suppose? is a mathematical probability that a set of circumstances which I have just shared with you could just randomly occur. As a believer, I need no calculations. Faith in the book of Hebrews in the King James Version is refined 
as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. My family, my parents, my family, my brothers, others, friends, and the little community of Hopeton, New York. 1,500 people when the college is not in session. Prayed for me. And I believe I am here speaking now as a result of their prayers. There is not a day of my life that I do not think about Korea and I'll buzz Harry and the men who fought there and the men who died there and thank God for his mercy and for all who fought and prayed for me. All of us who were prisoners of war Thank all who fought for our freedom from the bottom of our hearts. For as the scriptures also say, for no greater love, and if any man, and he laid down on his own life, for his friend. May God bless all of you. May God bless the Phoenix Christian School. And may God continue to bless this great country of ours, the United States of America. Thank you.